This program is made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you. Times change and things pass. Our first loose tooth, our old black dog, the innocence of our childhoods, bathing suit styles. Gone too are buildings and institutions. Not just of concrete, wood, or flesh, but identity. Things that reflected who we Northwesterners were, how we talked, what was important at the time. This is a look back at just a few of those things that aren't here anymore but that still exists in pictures, in stories, and in memories. Those of us who've lived here a while will recognize the landmarks and their stories, and newcomers will see glimpses of today's Puget Sound identity emerging from our past. For one of the renowned spokespersons of that past, here's Professor Reimer. If you remember this, you're a pioneer or a customer at the captain's table where these words are on the placemat. How we love the old Seattle in the days so brave and fine and the streetcar's merry rattle on the Esler cable line and the gold rush to Alaska men with shovels, picks, and pans and the battleship Nebraska on the skeel blocks at Morton Rands how we love those days so splendid, full of unexpected treats, when the Indian women vended butter clams on downtown streets. Downtown Seattle was a different place in those days. It was the center for theater, entertainment, and shopping. Ladies would dress up and head downtown to street after street of well-appointed stores. Rhodes, Cresses, Bests, Pennies, Woolworths, I. Magnon, McDougal Southwick, and of course, who can forget? hard to think of Seattle without thinking of Frederick and Nelson and vice versa. It was an integral part of Seattle for so many years. It was what I think of as an institution. The first thing that I noticed about Frederick and Nelson when I went to work there in 1943 was that there was an aura about the place that I could only liken to say the Louvre in Paris. You walked in and there was a hush. There was nothing impetuous. It was sort of quiet and lovely and elegant. And it was ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, if you would. It's just that it's been there as long as I've been around. And it just went with going downtown was going to Frederick's, which was a special treat. It was a beautiful store, and the people were nice, and they had beautiful things. Going to Frederick and Nelson. Oh, you got that at Frederick's? That yes. Generations of Northwesterners came to Frederick and Nelson not only to shop, but to gather. The tea room was one of the most important places for women in Seattle. They would come, they would meet their friends there. It was the first time when you were modeling, you would see the ladies come in with their either their granddaughters or their daughters. We did a tea room fashion show every Wednesday, rain or shine. And they had the men's grill. Mm -hmm. That was a very special place where the men could go and sit quietly and do their business. And then, of course, there was the Paul Bunyan room downstairs. True. 
And, and that was more in our price range at the time. <laughs> sodas was a good thing, you know. A lot of sodas and sundaes and shakes and malted milks. That was a real good thing. Yeah. And I still like them. <laughs> it was my idea to come up with the, uh, the ice cream, but I had to figure out how to put the flavoring in the, and the chocolate in the ice cream, and that's what took a little while to do it. But I did it. <laughs> I had salesmen try to catch me making frango mint ice cream for a long time. Well, I suppose they most have forgot about it now. But I have talked to people, and they say, oh, boy, that's, that was great stuff, you know. But um, no, see, it's, it's been quite a while since they made good ice cream there. I started on the elevators the fall of 42, but I was frightened to death, and I was 16. I was 16 when I first started. But this was the ultimate job in the city. Well, we thought we were very glamorous. <laughs> and you were. you were. At the time. Well, it was a, oh, we thought it was a glamorous job. I won't say that we thought <clears throat> we were, but it was of a glamorous job. Of course you did. <laughs> but uh, the elevator girls had cute, um, uh, high design clothes and were, I would say, the harbinger of fashions for the next season. We all had to be 5'4 and we had to have dark hair. We all thought, after all, Dorothy Lamore was discovered on uh, running an elevator at Marsha Field in Chicago. And she was 5'4 and had dark hair. <laughs> and so we all with tongue and cheek, thought we were going to be discovered, but um, tongue and cheek, yeah, indeed. Oh, no, just Brent. hoping, uh, just hoping. <laughs> to us, Christmas was the highlight of of the year at Frederick and Nelson, and we worked Christmas year round. Uh, immediately after we had pulled one Christmas trim out, we sat down and planned the rough form of the next one. First of all, they set up over Thanksgiving weekend. And not before. Not a day before. And yes. so when they opened the day after Thanksgiving, it was this With glorious. a million lights. And all the lights and the glitter. And people came downtown to be able to celebrate part of their holiday in that atmosphere. Some of that atmosphere included live animals in the Frederick and Nelson windows. Oh, the first set of reindeer that we had at the store, we brought down from Alaska, and we weren't into animal husbandry at that point in time. I can tell you from what transpired. I should say first, the window was not heated. It's cold, but Seattle's cold isn't like the Arctic cold. So we noticed that some patches of fur were beginning to come out. Well, we would gather up the patch and put some glue on it and put it back on. And then we came in one morning and one of them was missing one antler, standing there half antlered, which was a pretty ugly looking thing. So we tried first to glue it back on. Well, that didn't work because the animal would twitch its head all over. So then we wired it and ran a strap under its chin. Well, <laughs> before this is over, all of the reindeer were wearing chin straps to hold their, their horns in place. And most of the hair had fallen off them. They were the motliest looking, moth-eaten batch of animals you ever saw in your life. But my favorite Christmas would have been along about 1965, we discovered the little lights out of Italy that were no bigger than a grain of wheat. And we did the total store, inside, outside, windows, and everything in bare vine maple branches that were frosted as though so you had just beautiful. come upon a frosty scene with over a half million of these little lights. I think families loved coming 
to Frederick and Nelson for Christmas. Not only was it beautiful, but it was for the children. And our Santa, we did the first live Santa window that was ever done. I don't remember how I got in. Well, you I heard recommended about it, me. and I said, Pat, we've got to do this. <laughs> and so, and you said, be a Christmas fairy? <laughs> I wasn't sure I was ready. you were ready for that. But I can remember going home with smiley muscles that ached so badly, don't even ask me to talk. I can't move my mouth. <laughs> He'd be grinning and smiling for eight hours. They'd line up for a walk yes. back, uh, waiting in line waiting to get out in. out there in the cold to get in to see Santa Claus. I have a picture here of one, one of my kids. She stiffened up right there. <laughs> I don't want to be here. <laughs> Sorry to see the drapers pull down those windows. That was sad. Oh, yeah. yeah, heartbreaking to see Fredericks go down. I think that you miss something that was very special to an awful lot of people here, to Seattle, to Washington. I think, and it will never be again. People went downtown in those days to the movie houses. Uh, uh, Seattle had a lot of downtown uh, theaters. They went downtown to go to a dance at, up at Third and Wall, the train on ballroom. And every time I went to Seattle, downtown Seattle, it was an adventure. My mother's aunt lived in Georgetown, and. I would go over there to stay for a week, and she would take me into town maybe a couple times during the week. And we'd go downtown on a streetcar. She'd take me to the Florence Theater down by the, to a show by the Smith Tower, or we'd go in for, she'd have pie and coffee at Manning's on Third Avenue. The streetcars was a, were a means of getting around because not everybody had automobiles. And uh, for the most part, uh, that's the only way they had to travel, was by streetcar. And you'd get on the streetcar in Fauntleroy and go downtown, transfer downtown, go clear out to the university district for eight and a third cents. Everyone traveled on the cable cars. Every time you went downtown, you saw some of the same people because there weren't many people in Seattle. The difference between the uh, trolleys and cable cars was the streetcars had a trolley wheel that ran on a, a overhead wire, and the electricity came down through the trolley pole to the motors on the trucks. The cable cars had a grip on it that went down and gripped onto a cable that traveled about eight miles an hour, same as they do in San Francisco. Well, the uh, cable cars had a little rumble, and they went slowly up a hill, but it gave you a sensation of almost being in an elevator coming down a hill. You could see the mountains, you could see the lake, you could see the sound from the cable car. Oh, the Funnery Line was my favorite line. It, uh had a lot of fast running and had a lot of trestle work that went on. And, uh, and it was a sightseeing line. Going across Spokane Street, you could look down on uh, Harbor Island. You could see the Ellet Bay Mill on the other side. They had little houseboats down there and had wooden coal yards and uh, all kinds of things to see. I heard people describe it as a rickety old trestle. I, I don't remember being a rickety, a pretty solid. I would ride on the first seat on the right-hand side up by the door. I like to watch the motorman operate the controller and air brake, and, and you could hear the hiss of the air brake, and, uh, and then you could hear the rumble of the air compressor. 
the streetcars in the morning would be crowded, and they'd be crowded coming home at night. Standing in the morning, and uh, you would hold the strap and you'd sway with the car just as, a, as it moved. By 1940, Seattle's trolley service was being systematically dismantled in favor of electric buses. Most local residents greeted the change as progress, but many still felt compelled to mark the passing of an era. On the Queen Anne counterbalance's final run, a youthful mob stormed the car. A gesture of farewell, they got out of hand. In the mob was 21-year-old law school honors student Wallace Aiken. Somebody said, you know, let's stop it and get on it. There was no intent. It, uh, it's like any mob. There was no leader and, and uh, no goal when you got on it. Just uh, the wave hit. There was a, a supermarket or just a store near the top of the hill, and we got the discarded vegetables from there. I think we put them on the track, and then there were some people on the car, and somebody said, let's throw the seats out. And I think a lot of the windows were broken. It was fun till we got to the bottom. Mob members were greeted at the bottom of the hill by Seattle police. I suppose it was Reza because it was the last one there, and I know I had a white shirt on. I think we spent two nights in jail. Aiken's arrest turned out a blessing. The dean of the law school arranged for a firm to defend him, a firm which ultimately hired Aiken and eventually made him partner. I think we'd do it again. It was, it was the end of an era. It had probably been used by 40 years of people attending Queen Anne High School, and it was a memory for them and a memory for us. And it lived on to today, I guess. For me, uh, it was a sad day when they, because streetcars were fun to ride. I think we should have kept either Yesler or Madison. Because when I go to San Francisco, I often think they didn't give up all their old things. New things are nice. But it's just like they say, make new friends, but keep old. For today, we'll take an old Indian name trip around the sound. Here we start, come along. I love it from Tulalip to Puyallup, Squim and Pished, and to the Dosi Wallops, where so many times I fished. Traveling by boat has always been a big part of the Puget Sound region. But back before there were many roads and bridges, it was often the only way to go. You got across Lake Washington via ferry, and on the Sound, Mosquito Fleet vessels carried people between towns and between islands up until the 1930s. Demand for the little run slacked off, and the new Black Ball ferry line replaced the romantic old steamers. Well, the Mosquito Fleet were little steamers averaging 80 feet or so. A reporter standing at a wharf looked out and he said, uh, they leave the docks like so many mosquitoes skittering across the surface of the water. The Manitou uh, docked, as most of the Mosquito Fleet vessels did, down at uh, the uh, Coleman Dock on the Seattle waterfront. It was a creature of the water, and you had the feeling you were on something alive. But the appeal was the fresh air and the scenery and the clouds and the waves, especially if it was rough. It was a great deal of fun. The Manitou's whistle, it had a melody to it, somewhat like a railroad locomotive whistle today, which is oh, oh, oh. I had a job uh, at the Pacific National Bank in Seattle. I would uh, commute the year round on the steamer Manitou. You knew the captain, you knew the purser, you knew the engineer down in the engine room. They were all friends, 
just as you would with an ordinary friend. Uh, some of the housewives would, who were not traveling in would come down to the Manitou and when she stopped in, on Bainbridge Island and say, George, would you mind picking up some of this thread for me at the 10 cent store? And George would run and do these favors for people, for the women who were not going in. We, both of us, my wife and I, regarded the mosquito flight vessel, any of them, as a true boat. They were beautiful, sleek lined uh, like this. The ferries were pudgy like this. This was a, your yacht, and it was adventurous, and it could, uh, if it wanted to, uh, buy a vote of the passengers. Maybe we thought uh, we could do a little adventuring. That never took place, but that was a feeling we had that it belonged to us. Of all the black ball ferries that replaced the Mosquito Fleet, perhaps the most famous was the Kalakala, a noble experiment in form, almost a complete failure in function. The old days were rather remarkable back and forth without running aground. We got back and forth without hitting each other most of the time. She was very streamlined. She was far, far ahead of her time. And it was a great um, tourist attraction uh, because of its unusual design. I don't think even airplanes had that sleek a design at that time. But the clock law, there was a lot of elegance in that cabin. There was a lot of brass, unfortunately, for the cabin crew. They were, about half of their time was spent polishing brass. It was really a tourist boat. There were many things about it that, that fascinated me. There was many things that frightened me. There were uncomfortable things. The pilot house was too low, and the visibility was the pits. When you have glass that is sloped back, heavy glass in a porthole, it sloped back on a sharp angle like that. Then you're looking down through the glass, and my goodness, you're looking through that much glass, and that filters a lot of vision. She had a, a rather an obnoxious behavior of failing to reverse engines. On one occasion, uh, Skipper came in with a Kalakla and uh, went to back down, and she charged full ahead. And they finally got her backing just before they hit the seawall. Right there, the last way. Put a nice flat space across the bow of the clock lower, and bend it back. And it's uh, fortunate that the seawall was there. They'd probably derail the train. You never know. <laughs> oh, they, they called her the laughing codfish and the silver slug. She was definitely unique. The it, it sounds and everything were, were her own. It vibrated a lot. The galley, particularly, gosh, if you didn't watch your coffee when you set it down, it'd be over your neighbor's uh, stool, you know, just jazz right down the counter. As charming as the vessel was and, and as spectacular in many ways, uh, they never made a second one, which tells me uh, one was enough. <laughs> it was for me. <laughs> Say, are you old enough to remember old-time radio? Remember this. Now the position of the pitch to look at Steichen. Van Dyke delivers. It's a ground ball back at the pitcher. He knocked it down. He picked it up on the uh, dirt pitching goal, throws him off. It was more exciting then. It was. Just to hear him announce it. Here comes that ball. Swing and a miss. Like Leo Lassen say, back, back, back. Seattle's Rainier Valley, home to Six Stadium and the Seattle Rainiers, was also home to a big community of Italian immigrants. 
The neighborhood and the stadium grew up together, their stories so closely linked as to almost be one. In 1938, Mr. Sick bought the ball club from Ball Bill Clapper for $75,000, and then he built a stadium out there on Rainier Avenue for $350,000. It was just a beautiful stadium. The grass was green, seated about 17,000 people, and we packed them in out there all the time. Prevaca used to own uh, the a farm up in the back of left field fence, and they call it Pre's Cabbage Patch. We had um, the garden, some of the garden was right below it, and the house was right up above the garden. We had plenty of baseballs come over in the garden. That's how close it was. A lot of young people and even older people, you know, young adults would come. They didn't decide they were going to go to the game until the last minute. And they would itch themselves up through the farm and come up on the hillside there and watch the game. A lot of them would come to the house and then ask us if they could sit there on the porch and watch the game. My father-in-law, we were all amiable about that. We said, OK, as long as they didn't go in the farm and trample on the vegetables. And that's why they called it Tightwad Hill, because people didn't have to pay to go <laughs> to the park. But it was fun. It really was fun. That porch would be filled with people. Right here on the foot of Queen Anne Hill, here where I lived, there used to be an Italian neighborhood. Not in Rainier Valley, they used to call it Garlic Gulch. Everybody knew each other because um, from the, the fact that they all had farms, they all knew each other. They all came from practically the same background of, of, of area in, in Italy. And it's like homesteading. They bought a piece of property and then bought another little piece until it made a farm. They settled there. And so uh, then they had their children. Then others came from Italy and bought another piece of property next to them. So it was just like one big happy family with the Sackos, Ginzals, D'Onofio and us. Then up farther from Coleman were the Constantinos, the Ingos on Rainier, and then on Walker was the... Um, Tony LaSalle had the, the shoe, shoe shop there. Shop on Atlantic Street. And then the Sacco brothers had a fruit and vegetable stand like my brother. After we were married and my husband worked, and he decided he wanted to have his own business. And he built this open air market. Our priest and all of our people that went to our church knew about our store and decided they all was, were faithful to each other as far as trading from their business friends. And all the people that knew each other from the Italian colony went to Merlino's, they went to these stores to buy all their Italian products. So all of our friends and relatives traded from us because that was the thing to do in those days. The women there wanted the right things, the best things, the right size tomatoes and the best of everything. They had the corn, the special corn. Pre's dad would pick it in the morning, box it up, bring it out to the store, and we'd sell it. Crates and crates of corn. And then when the ballpark was there, so my husband was very interested in ball games because he played ball. And at the same time, um, the, the ball players used to always go over to my husband's store. And we got to know a lot of the ball players. We had fun. One was Harry Taylor. God, he was handsome. Oh, that guy was. Ooh. Al Turpin and Edo Van. Yeah, but we were just kids, you know, yeah. they were older than us. Bill that. Lawrence. I was 18 years old and I uh, was going to Queen Anne and I had a football and baseball scholarship from the University of Washington. And there was another youngster by the name of Fred Hutchinson that went to Franklin High School. And the Seattle Ball Club signed us up and we played with the Rainiers in 1938. Well, I played the outfield. I was a hustling fool. I enjoyed playing baseball, and, and that baseball was my love, and that's the way I played the game. 
We had a, a young kid by the name of Fred Hutchinson who won 25 and lost seven. Oh, Freddie Hutchinson on his Yeah, that night. Birthday. That was the That's most exciting the one that was great. One. It was exciting to see the crowd, the way they turned out. When they had to have people out in the field and blocked it off. 19th birthday and he won his 19th game. Fred Hutchinson and the Rainiers are gone. And so too is the core of the old neighborhood. But the memories remain. The ballpark was part of our whole area. So I think that when you have a community, if they stick together, you know, all and have a, like a colony, then they, they stay with each other and know each other for years. It was just a real nice life. I mean, it was not because other people don't have good lives now. It's just because the old days were really more the fun days, I think. Everybody knew each other. The first Birdland, they really were what they call a nightclub. And they brought in national talent, but it wasn't, uh, you know, at that time, there wasn't a lot of minorities performing on TV that got any kind of radio time. So those bands like James Brown and Big Mama Thornton and some people like that, they would come through there at Birdland, you know, during the time it was a nightclub. You walk into Birdland, and then immediately you'd have to squint because it was dark. You know, we believed in that dark made the bandstand illuminate pretty good because the bandstand was the most lit up thing in the place. I was the main house band and I played the dance music and the other people were the stars of the show and then I'd come back on for the dancing part. The music we played was, it, it had to be like, uh, it had to have like a dominating kind of a beat to it. You know, it had to be like really pulsive. One of the favorite was like that honky tonk, you hear that? So then the band will... You know what I mean? So that we could just, just keep going. And that was just hitting them. Pow, doom, doom, pow. You know what I mean? And then everybody... You know, when I played there and the band played, I would look out into the crowd and... I mean, they were so into the music that it just made the band play just that much better. You know, you could see them just working themselves to death. I bet everybody in there lost maybe five, six pounds a night. They danced, as long as the music went, they'd be out on the floor dancing. Everybody tried to outdo each other on dance steps or, you know, get the fancy steps or turn the biggest flip. That was the biggest attraction that, that Birdland had was you could dance there. You know, you could come in there and let your hair down and, or take it off, you know. For instance, a lot of people came to me and said, well, you know, I met my wife at Birdland. You know, we were, we were, I asked her to dance, and then, you know, you make your date from there, you know, or you call it catching, you know. I caught out of Birdland, you know. And dancing uh, was very uh, useful in the art of catching. For instance, if a girl saw a guy dancing really good, wow, I think I want to dance with him. You see what I mean? And they could actually go over and ask him to dance. It didn't come to me that it was ever going to not be there, you know what I mean, at any point until it wasn't there anymore. I think it should have been one of the landmarks that they kept in Seattle. It's a parking lot now, but actually it's just a car and parking strips, white lines, the whole block. And there's the coldness on the corner now. There's a new baby at Will Loman's house in Anna Cortes, Washington. A five-month-old, 18-pound gorilla named Bobo. Loman bought him from the man who captured him in Africa, plans to raise him as a member of the family until he's four or five, then sell him to a zoo or circus. 
When people came to the house, they didn't come there to see my daughters or me or my mother and dad. They came there to see him. Everybody knew Bobo. He was a Seattle and Bobo went together. In this area, if you mention Bobo even now, anyone that wasn't just born knows who you're talking about. It was uh, 1951, December, and I was on a trip back east. Columbus, Ohio is where there was a, call him a big game hunter who lived there. So I told him I was looking for a chimpanzee. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, by the way, what's that, what's that pounding upstairs? Are you doing some remodeling? And they said, no, that's our baby gorilla. Do you want to see it? And I said, yes, I'd like to see it, but I'm not in the market for one because I know how much they cost. Here's that $4,000 rattle. That's what I heard that day when he was, if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't even know they had a baby gorilla. We had had a lot of unusual animals in the past, not, not a gorilla by any means. We'd had a spider monkey. Uh, we'd had various wild animals like crows and seagulls and owls, and we'd had mice and we'd had rats and besides your normal dogs and so on. And luckily my grandparents were fairly flexible folks, and so my grandmother basically became the surrogate mother, so to speak, for, for Bobo. And he was treated just like any human baby would have been treated. He had his bath every morning and a fresh change of clothes and his bottles and his doctor's appointments. Here's his uh, jumpers, suit, overalls. He wore these kind of clothes every day. My mother insisted on, on that. You know, it's hard to believe. You know, he got to be 525 pounds. And you wonder, how could he ever got that on? Well, he was a baby like all of us at one time. He basically slept with my grandmother and my, or my grandfather. Um, every night he was part of the family, he ate at the table. He went in the car with us, he went to the drive-in, uh, he went to the gas station. We had a little city bus that went up and down the streets in those days. And the bus driver told me one time, he said, Bill, do you know what happened the other day? I said, no, what? He said, I came by your house and I wasn't thinking very good and I saw a little kid there, I thought, with a pillow over his shoulder, wearing clothes, I stopped and opened the door, and then I saw it was Bobo, he said. So Bobo was gonna get on the bus and go with us to kindergarten. He said, but I closed the door and dug out of there. <laughs> it was fun, like at school, you know, you get, you get an awful lot of attention. However, in later years, when they call you, there's Bobo's sister, when you're in, like, in junior high school, that wasn't really appreciated. <laughs> My father and Bobo had just a great relationship, and they played, and it, uh, there was a lot of real connection between the two of them. It, it was fun. He liked rough games. He liked uh, energetic things. He would like a game like hide-and-go-seek and, go seek and uh, anything like a balloon around. He couldn't wait till he broke it. And uh, the piano, he'd get up there and play with his feet. He'd walk back and forth across the keys. So his favorite trick with my dad was to wait till my dad was really looking at the TV and not expecting it, come behind his rocking chair and give it a great big pull and it'd go over backwards. My dad would go sliding out, backwards out of the chair. And my dad would get up, disgusted, mad and everything, and chase Bobo around. Bobo, a lot of times, then he'd run out to the kitchen where my mother was busy, go hide behind her. I can still hear the argument. Raymond, don't you dare hit him. Well, he just tipped me over again. He says, I don't care, he's just a baby. Now, you leave him alone. And my dad had come back out matter next. Says, that dog gone fast. He said, if he does that again, I'm gonna try to grab him. My dad could never get him in time, he was too fast. <laughs> but baby Bobo grew increasingly strong and unintentionally destructive. So we realized this couldn't go on forever. Dad and I were essentially not even blue collar, just uh, dirty collar working people. And uh, 
You go out and you work hard in the morning and come back for lunch and find out he'd broken something that just canceled out what you'd earned by hard work that morning. The Lomans tried to build Bobo a gorilla-proof shed, but he couldn't stand to be left alone. With great sadness, they turned to the Woodland Park Zoo. It was very difficult for all of us, and I think we tried to put on um, a good face for the day, so to speak. We felt like we were putting, you know, a child up for adoption into a cage. Arrangements were made for Mrs. Lohman to stay with Bobo. And the zoo people had rigged up a cot for her there and had made arrangements so she could have meals served and whatnot. But after about three weeks or so, my dad was getting tired of my cooking at home. And he said, this is it. We're going down there and get your mother back up here. So we drove down there to get her, and she didn't want to leave. She said, I can't leave him. So we just almost bodily kidnapped her and brought her home. Bobo was more of an attraction than all of the rest of the zoo put together. Some people were there every day, every day of the year. He loved, he did love to entertain, and there would be times when he would just race around the cage and, you know, on the tire, on the table, up one way and down the other, and up to the window, and he would pat the windows really hard, and, you know, the kids would all back away. In 1963, Bobo was introduced to Fifi, a female gorilla. Well, Fifi had like a pot belly. She wasn't attractive at all. Her face was very round, and she had a real, more like a pushed in nose, you know, more like my Persian cat. I think if they had maybe selected a better looking gorilla, things might have gone better for him. <laughs> so. Visiting him was a, was a difficult thing for us, and it was sometimes uh, very sad and, and sometimes tearful. My dad and my grandfather went to the zoo to, to see Bobo and see how things were going. He apparently spotted my dad and my grandfather, and he began to really uh, make a big ruckus. And pretty soon, the keeper came out and said, all right, who's causing you know, the gorilla to act up like that or something. And then he spotted my dad and my grandfather. And so he invited them to come back. The real touching thing that happened was that Bobo had an apple and he did just the reverse of what my dad used to do for him. And Bobo leaned up against the back of the, of the window part there where my dad was. And he took the apple and he twisted it in half and he just reached over his shoulder and gave the other half to my dad. And that was exactly what um, my dad used to do for Bobo. But it was pretty darn obvious that he certainly recognized him and, and um, hadn't forgotten. So I think the thing I learned about it, it's really cruel to take an animal such as a gorilla and keep them in your home when you know that you cannot continue to keep them there. He died as a result of blood clots from a fractured hip. Thousands of people down there knew Bobo better than they knew anybody on the city council or the mayor or anybody else. They probably felt a lot worse losing Bobo than they did about humans. You know, the thing was, people got educated. So all of the Northwest here, people had the opportunity to see this gorilla and become acquainted and watch him in action. And, and it, was, it, it was a good thing. It was selfish for us to have him at home any more, any longer than we had to. At last, the Seattle World's Fair. Look at that observation tower. A 600-foot marvel. They call it the Space Needle, and the restaurant on top revolves. What a view. All of the fair in Seattle, too and a galaxy of fun in the gateway. Seattle World's Fair, here we come.
wasn't until in the 50s that the voters voted in liquor by the drink. Up until that time, the only place you could get a drink was in clubs. And so after that time, restaurants proliferated around Seattle simply because of that fact. Ruby Chow's was a place to be seen both by newspaper people and police. And the first thing you did when you walked into Ruby Chow's, you would look around to see who was there and who you recognized. And uh, she held parties for the press, and they were really parties. The, the drinks and the newspaper people got together pretty fast. I remember one incident in which there was a party going on in there, and. Uh, Somebody made uh, the comment that if, if the noise increased too much more, they'd call the police. But Ruby said that uh, th they wouldn't have to do that because uh, the chief of police, Jimmy Lawrence, was eating in the, in, in, in the other room. The chief of police, I remember Chief Raymond, Chief Lawrence, uh, Chief uh, Robert Hansen, Chief Eastman, that's going way back. I think after they worked so hard and under so much pressure, they would come and, and sit and enjoy themselves. Ruby's was the focus of Chinese culture for a lot of white people. That's where they heard the Chinese music, they, they, they saw the Chinese decorations, the colors, the food. Going to Chinatown was not at all popular at that time. People just didn't go there. They were a, a little this way about it, that they, they didn't care. But Ruby was outside. She was a Broadway in Jefferson. So it was easy for white people to get there and to enjoy it. I had a lot of customers that came in that said, Ruby, order for us. And I would have them try our different dishes, like, um, um, prawns in a uh, garlic sauce and maybe with uh, oyster sauce and there were other food that I wanted them to try which they were not they didn't want to try but until I coaxed them into trying after they tried they liked it it's like uh, the hundred year old eggs right away they said oh, hundred year old eggs and I explained to them I said well look what you do with cheese you take it and you put it away until it gets green and black then you bring it out then you eat it and it's the same thing after we'd escaped from the police beat long enough to go to uh, Ruby's about midnight on Saturday nights, I was ready for anything about that time of night. And that's the first place where I learned to eat with chopsticks. Not well, and I still don't eat well with chopsticks. The customers and other people, not just the customers, would be very appreciative when I tell them about these things. If anything, she was the bridge. She was a kind of a bridge between the Chinese community and, uh, and, and, the, and the white community. Without the restaurant, I don't think I could have done all the things that I've done that has uh, helped me. I'd help my husband and help my family uh, do a lot of community work, and which I'm very grateful for. We uh, started the drill team in 1952, and the dragon went out, and uh, we were part of the Seafair Parade. I miss Ruby Chow's, yes. Ruby Chow was a restaurant with a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. Some of the famous people that came to Ruby Chow was uh, Tommy Dorsey, Sammy Davis, Sidney Portier, uh, Giselle McKenzie, Rhonda Fleming, Lucille Ball. People just flocked there and they would stand in line and waited to get in. It was like being on a football field, the ball, ball is dropped in my hand and I had to run with it. And that's what happened. From the 30s through the 60s, boating fans gathered on the banks of the Sammamish Slough every spring to cheer on their favorites in the annual slough scramble.
And of course, there were the Thunderbolts. In the 50s, Stan Sayers and Slow Motion 4 broke world straightaway records and brought the Gold Cup to Seattle. And it wasn't just roar and rooster tails that brought fun seekers flocking to the water. At the Aqua Theater on Green Lake South Shore, thousands came to see outdoor aquatic shows and musical theater under the stars. Well, the Aqua Theater was on the south shore of Green Lake. It was right on the shore. It was unique. I don't think I've ever run across anything like it anywhere. The heyday, I guess, if you call it that, would be from about 55 to 62. It was really designed for use with the Aqua Follies, a, a water show. To get more use out of it, I think they felt it would be suitable for, and they did plan, I know, to have musical shows there. It was certainly not highbrow entertainment. It was a come as you are, atmosphere. The people who went to the Aqua Theater, I think, were about as total a cross-section as you could have, because people came and brought their kids. A lot of them on the weekends would spend the afternoon at the beach and then go to the show at night. The Aqua Darlings were the dancers. The Aqua Deers were the swimmers. Uh, and the aqua deers, of course, we could only see from above, so everything would visually have to be in formations. And, and it was it was a family show. I mean, it was it was a mixed show. Kids and adults all liked it. It was virtually vaudeville with precision swimming and good dancing, good singing, and. Unusual diving. It wasn't something that Seattleites often had a chance to see at that point. It was good stuff. It was real entertaining. Well, typically, as we got into about the middle of July, the musical shows would start. There's just something magic about about musical theater when it's when it's done right. And on a, on a beautiful night, with the stars out, half the time the moon would be up there. Um, then the lights on the stage, the music. It, it was a magic time. I was sort of the local leading man, I guess. You could know. so I usually had the, the, the male romantic lead. <laughs> well, I think the, the role that I enjoyed doing the most was the role of Frank Butler in Annie Get Your Gun. The guy's real conceited. <laughs> well, it's kind of fun to play somebody who's who's got that big male ego, you know. We always had to battle the elements at the Aqua Theater. When it was a nice, warm summer night, one of these idyllic things with the stars out and and just one of those magic nights, those of us on stage had to worry about the bugs because they would swarm to the lights. And then when it rained, the uh, stage became very slippery. So the dancers were very apprehensive. If we had to do the, the show with some rain, they, the dancing would change. They would, they would more or less ad lib their, their dance routines. Uh, another thing that happened, of course, was that the uh, stringed instruments and the woodwinds would uh, not want to stay there at all if it started to rain. We had an understanding, I guess, that if we got past the intermission before the show had to be called off because of rain, we didn't have to give back the, uh, the uh, ticket price. But if they didn't get to intermission, then the, uh, the tickets were refunded and we did another performance. So 
it was true that that uh, when the when the skies were threatening, and particularly if there were a few drops falling, the tempos, Gus would pick up the tempos to the point where uh, it was pretty obvious that he was trying very hard to get to the intermission without having to uh, break up the show. The performances at the Opera Follies were were really. Um, were very dynamic uh, from the minute the show started. I mean, you have to imagine, here's an open-air theater in, on a nice summer evening in Seattle. You learn to do comedy diving by doing straight diving poorly. And comedy diving just always struck me as something funny from the first time I saw it. Uh, given the right setting, it, it's just hilarious, and to this day it still is. I think those were a favorite just because they tickled people and, and were a little bit ridiculous too. The dives took all sorts of different forms. A horse and rider dive was one where uh, one comedy diver would go out and bounce up and do a reverse somersault, and another person would run underneath him and he would land on his waist and together they'd go into the water. I would do a side step off, which is simply uh, where you go out and take a massive hurdle and miss the side of the board with one leg and do a side somersault on the board and fall in. Uh, in addition to that, I did uh, the long suit dive, which is the one from the tower where you, you dive in and your pant legs stay up on the tower. Um, I was in the pile up with five other divers right at the end of the diving sequence. Uh, some of the comedy dives were dangerous, you bet they were. Uh, there's some real acrobatics going on out there, and particularly because you've got divers coming down right one on top of another, uh, and you have to miss each other, obviously. And there's nothing like standing up on the top of a 10-meter tower on a summer night, watching the taillights and headlights on Aurora Avenue, and the stars in the sky reflecting off of Green Lake and listen to all that beautiful music and all you had to do was dive and get paid for it. It was an institution in Seattle that uh, I think brought a lot of happiness and entertainment to people. People used to tell me how much fun they had going to the Aqua Theater shows and I'd always tell them that we had more fun on the stage than they did in the audience. Many of the people and things of our past are gone, but their memories persist and will always be an important part of what makes this home. I've traveled all over this country, and I'll say that if man ever found a place to be peaceful and quiet, that spot is on Puget Sound. No longer a slave of ambition, I laugh at the world and its shams as I think of my happy condition surrounded by acres of clams. <laughs> This program is made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you.